I'm Chris Given Wilson. I've spent my university teaching career at St Andrews University, where I taught for 36 years. Uh, four years ago, I retired, and uh, I'm now emeritus professor at the University of St Andrews. My talk today is about the Mortimer family, and particularly what I would like to term the Mortimer clan in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, uh, because this was a time when the Mortimers suffered a succession of early deaths and long minorities and they relied a lot on the brothers and brothers-in-law and sisters and wives and widows and uncles of the various earls to maintain the, uh, the validity of the Mortimer claim to the throne of England. Not that this was uh, a claim which was put forward uh, uh, by the Mortimer Earls themselves at this time. They were far too sensible to do that. Had they done so, they would have had their head chop heads chopped off very rapidly. But there were plenty of people who worked on their behalf to ensure that the Mortimer claim to the throne was not uh, neglected and was not forgotten during this time with the consequences for the House of York in the late 15th century, which we all know well about. Thank you, Philip, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I have to say, I want to say to start with, um, I think that the Mortimer History Society is a shining example um, in the scope of its activities, uh, the standards that it sets, and the um, organisational efficiency with which it uh, arranges events of what a local history society really should aspire to. And uh, I, am, I am delighted. And I am, I am delighted to be here. Um, for this talk, you need the genealogy, which is called Mortimer Connections. It is um, the third one in the booklet, um, sub second half of the booklet that you have got. And it mentions, I think, everybody that I'm going to mention um, in the next 40 minutes um, or so. Now, um, my paper is divided into five parts. Um, Eight-year-olds, teenagers, mothers, sisters, widows, wives, uncles, and finally, the longest part, Edmund the Good, Henry IV, and Henry V. Now, this might sound a little bit whimsical, um, but I hope that all will be explained. Uh, so, let's start with eight-year-olds. Uh, Adam Musk is perhaps the foremost chronicler, and indeed a protege, of the Mortimer family in the late 14th and early 15th century, centuries. And in his chronicle, he includes a passage in the first year of Henry V's reign, um, which uh, in 1413 to 14, uh, which reads as follows. Two Welsh children, one of whom was nine years old and the other just seven, together with their own child, whom the mother was suckling, were presented to the Earl of March who in turn gave them to the king, an event which caused widespread amazement, um, which perhaps should not cause surprise. Uh, now, this might seem incredible, uh, but I am reliably informed by Google, uh, the, the fount of all human and indeed inhuman knowledge, um, that it is actually possible for, children, for women, for girls, as young as six or even five, to give birth to children. Um, this is not normal, <laughs> but events, but uh, those, those occurrences apparently uh, have occurred. And Usk was very well informed about the Mortimers. And, um, you know, I think we actually have to believe this story. But why? Why did the Earl of March present these to the King? Well, as far as I know, the only historian who has commented on this passage is Ralph Griffiths in his Oxford Dictionary of National Biography uh, entry on Edmund. He described this as possibly an act of misplaced irony. And what he meant by that, or at least I assume what he meant by that, was that here was a 23-year-old unmarried uh, uh, Earl presenting uh, to uh, a, 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 a child born of, of eight-year-old um, children 
uh, because presumably the child was conceived when the boy was eight rather than nine, um, presenting a 27-year-old unmarried king with a message saying, it's time we got on with it. Um, and perhaps for both the Mortimers and for Henry V, that was not a bad message. Um, although it's possible that this was simply what you might call one of those sort of collector's items or freaks of nature, which medieval nobles quite often enjoyed um, uh, presenting to each other. Now, whether irony was really in Edmund's character is something I don't know. Uh, historians have tended to be rather unimpressed with Edmund. Brynmore Pugh, uh, who was never slow uh, with acerbic comments, uh, described Edmund, the fifth Earl of March, as mediocre, the least notable and distinguished of the five Mortimer Earls of March. Uh, Bruce McFarlane uh, was a little bit more restrained, but said historians are probably justified in reckoning him a lightweight. We actually don't have much insight into Edmund's <laughs> character. A lot of people spoke about him, but we hardly ever hear him talking himself. So I'd like to just um, give you one example um, from the year 1400, when we do apparently hear Edmund speaking for himself. And this is, um, this is part of a dispute which doesn't concern us at all, um, uh, except that it has this, this quote which I'm about to read you. Um, it's a dispute between the Abbey of Titchfield in Hampshire and the villagers of a, 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 near, a nearby, a neighbouring village called Hook. And the villagers of Hook had tried to set up a chapel and the abbot, was, the abbot of Titchfield was opposing this because he thought it was derogating from the rights of his monastery. And rather remarkably, this dispute ended up being considered by the King's Council. And someone who either was at or attended this council, uh, sorry, or, or, or spoke to people who attended this council, uh, sent an anonymous letter. We don't know who this person was, but he sent a letter to the abbot of Titchfield, which read as follows. Most honoured Lord, may it please you to know that I have been informed by some of my friends on our Lord the King's Council that you will soon be much aggrieved on account of Hook Chapel, because the King and his council have been informed by the Earl of March and other lords who are against you that it is necessary and profitable for all the community there, both for foreigners and for locals, to have their chapel. The King and his council are therefore minded to approve the aforesaid chapel at the request of the seven of March and several great lords, and for the peace of all the region. Now, as I say, the dispute doesn't concern us. Um, but uh, what will not have escaped your notice is that the Earl of March, referred to here, this was the summer of 1400, was Edmund, and Edmund was aged just eight at the time. Now, it's not surprising that Edmund wanted to defend the chapel because it had been founded by his, grandma, uh, his grandfather, uh, Earl Edmund, in the 1370s. But did this eight-year-old boy have the presence of mind, the courage, if you want, to go and stand up before the King's Council in the summer of 1400 um, and to present his case and apparently to win his case? And how does that uh, chime with the idea of Earl Edmund as a mediocre lightweight. Well, we'll come back to Earl Edmund uh, a little bit later. But let me move on now to look at teenagers. Um, a year before this, in 1399, Henry IV had usurped the throne of England from Richard II. And as we all know, there were some people who thought that Edmund ought to be the King of England, uh, for reasons which Matt has explained, uh, rather than Henry IV. And if not Edmund, then his younger brother, Roger. Edmund was born in 1391, Roger was born in 1393. Henry IV's reaction to this uh, sympathy for the Earl of March was very sensible. He pretended that he hadn't noticed. Uh, don't mention the Mortimers, uh, became almost an article of faith in early Lancastrian England, um, and certainly a test of loyalty with potentially fatal consequences. Under Richard III or the Tudors, it is possible 
that Edmund and his brother would have been quietly done away with in the Tower of London. Uh, early princes in the Tower, uh, if you want. But Henry IV didn't do that. For the next 10 years, from 1399 until 1409, he brought them up with his own younger children in the royal household, usually at either Windsor or at Berkhamsted, under the care of some of his most trusted retainers, men like Hugh Waterton uh, and John Pelham, who received about an average of about £300 a year for their maintenance. So they're probably uh, pretty well looked after. On one occasion, however, they, 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 were, they were kept pretty closely watched most of the time. But on one occasion, they were liberated. That was in February 1405, by which time Edmund was 13 and Roger, his younger brother, was 11. Um, a reckless locksmith at Windsor Castle was persuaded to make a duplicate set of keys. The boys were smuggled out of the castle and hastened westwards along what we now call the M4 corridor, almost certainly heading to Wales, uh, for reasons which will uh, become apparent later on. But they only got as far as Cheltenham when they were recaptured, apparently hiding in a wood in Cheltenham and taken back. The locksmith, having metaphorically lost his head, now did so literally, um, but Henry IV decided that the boys were too young uh, to be culpable uh, and were simply returned to their residence in Windsor, but they were watched more closely from now on and they tended to be moved around more frequently uh, um, in, in order to foil any further uh, plots to release them. The chief conspirator um, in removing uh, the uh, boys from Windsor was Constance. Uh, Constance Dispenser, uh, the widow of Thomas Dispenser, who briefly had been Earl of Gloucester before dying in 1400, trying to restore Richard II uh, to the throne. But she was also, and perhaps more importantly, the sister of Edward, Duke of York, uh, another great favorite of Richard II's, who had, or at least uh, ostensibly, accommodated himself to uh, Lancastrian kingship. Uh, Constance, when she was tried before the council a few weeks after the attempted abduction, um, Constance uh, implicated her brother, Edward, Duke of York. Um, a lot of things were insinuated against Edward, and quite a lot of them tended to be believed, because he was a rather unreliable uh, and hot-headed uh, character. So it's quite possible that he was um, in, in, implicated in this, but, 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 but uh, Henry uh, Henry locked them both up, locked Constance and Edward both up for just a few months, uh, but then pardoned them, uh, and they were really quite lucky uh, that it wasn't taken any further. So let's move on to look at mothers, sisters, widows and wives. Constance is but one example um, of a woman who played a significant part in the story of the Mortimers in the late 14th and early 15th century. But there were many others. For example, Edmund and Rogers, uh, Edmund, yes, Edmund and Roger's mother, whose name was Eleanor, the widow of Roger, the third Earl of March. She was also the daughter of Thomas Holland, who Matt mentioned, the Duke of Surrey, another great favorite um, of Richard II, who also <coughs> lost his life um, in, in what's called the Epiphany Rising, at, uh, trying to put Richard II on the throne in January 1400. So she was Richard II's niece. Now, Eleanor had married Roger in 1388. She bore him two sons and two daughters. Uh, and then in 1398, she was widowed when, as we've heard, Roger, the fourth Earl of March, was killed in Ireland. But in May, or possibly June 1399, certainly before Bolingbroke's revolution, Henry IV's revolution, in May or June 1399, she remarried. She married Edward Charlton, Lord of Paris, uh, another of the significant marcher lords. Now, two months later, as Bolingbroke was marching north along the Welsh border towards what would turn out to be a rendezvous with Richard II um, at Flint Castle, 
which was really the, sort of the, the crucial moment in, in the revolution. Two months later, as Bolingbroke moved northwards from Bristol, Eleanor and her new husband, Charlton, were at Usk Castle. And Bolingbroke was clearly going to be marching almost straight past um, Usk Castle. So what were they going to do? Here was a conflict um, of loyalties. What was Eleanor going to do? Was she going to stand up for the rights of her children, Edmund and Roger, or was she going to roll over and accept uh, the inevitable? Well, again, Adam Usk's Chronicle has a rather interesting passage, which uh, has not really been noticed um, very much. Adam himself, he's got a lot of bi autobiographical stuff in his chronicle, and he says here, also there at Bristol on the 29th to 30th of July, was the compiler of this present work, Adam. And it was through his influence that peace was made between Duke Henry and the Lordship of Us, his birthplace, which the Duke had intended to ravage on account of the resistance which the lady of that place, the King's niece, that's Eleanor, had planned there. This, um, this compiler also arranged for Sir Edward Charlton, who was then that lady's husband, to be retained by the Duke. And he got all the people of us who'd been brought together at one story, and I'm not sure where that place is, I've failed to identify it, in order to oppose the Duke to go back to their homes to their great relief. So, Adam makes it pretty clear that um, Eleanor and Edward Charlton had been planning to resist Henry. Um, but when they got a visit from our intrepid chronicler, who told them that this would be virtually uh, like committing suicide, they obviously decided not to bother. Now, the question, of course, arises, on whose behalf were they resisting? Were they resisting on behalf of Richard II, who was still, of course, king in name? Um, but I think that is pretty unlikely, uh, because, as, again, Matt was saying, uh, uh, Richard had been... Um, um, making dire threats against the Earl of March in the previous couple of years. And it seems to be much more likely that what she had planned was to resist Henry on behalf of her sons, on behalf of the right of, all her, of, of, of one or other, or pre presumably Edmund in the first instance, her sons. Um, and if that is the case, it's actually the only strictly contemporary evidence that we have that anyone was trying to do something to stand up for Edmund, Earl of March's rights in 1399, at the time of Bolingbroke's revolution. And not, of course, just anyone, but good old mum. However, Henry IV, the juggernaut, the Lancastrian juggernaut, was clearly by this time unstoppable. And uh, Eleanor, having been warned by Adam Usk that there was no point in doing this, she decided not to resist any further and continued to live discreetly with her new husband and her daughters uh, until 1405 when she died in childbirth. Now this brings me on to a general point to make about the Mortimer women in this period. And it's, it's, it's quite a familiar one but there's a particular point that I want to make about it. Between 1360 and 1425, that is a period of 65 years, we have just 24 years during which active adult earls were the leaders of the Mortimers. They were, as we know only too well, unlucky, or at least in the later Middle Ages. They tended to die early and to leave long minorities. This meant that the marriages that they made in terms of making political alliances um, were doubly significant. Um, because these were the families which were most likely to lend support or indeed to harness the resources of the Mortimer claim or the Mortimer estates to their own ends. Now, if you go back to the 1350s, the period from the, 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 roughly the third quarter of the 14th century, the major connections of the Mortimers were really with the, the, the Beecham Earls of Warwick, the Fitzalan Earls of Arundel, and the Boone Earls of Northampton, all of whom were related in one way or another uh, to, you know, I mean, usually, or invariably through marriage uh, with the Mortimer uh, family. But by the early 15th century, the orbit within, the orbit of connections, if you want, of the Mortimers had shifted decisively. And the most important connections that they now had were with the Earls of Northumberland and with the Ducal House of York. 
One connection in particular was clearly transformative in the history and the fortunes of the Mortimer family. And that was the marriage of the third Earl Rogers, sorry, the fourth Earl Rogers' sister, Elizabeth, in 1379, when she was eight years old, she was married to Henry Percy Hotspur, the son of the Earl of Northumberland. And this created a link with the Percy family, the Earls of Northumberland, which the Percys took very seriously indeed. After Earl Edmund's death in 1381, there was quite a row between Richard II and, and people who opposed him over what should be done with the wardship of the great Mortimer estates. And Richard initially tried to parcel these out to various of his rather, rather low-born, I mean knightly, uh, cronies. Um, but this caused such a stink that in the end he was obliged to hand them over to a consortium of earls, led by the earls of Arundel and Warwick and Northumberland, all of whom were related by marriage by this time to the Mortimer family. Now this consortium of earls, as we've heard, according to the, uh, had garnered great praise from the Wigmore Chronicler. Um, apparently they did their job extremely conscientiously for the next 11 years, uh, you, know, you know, looking after the estates, making sure they remained profitable and so forth, and, and when Roger came into his inheritance in 1394, they handed him about £26,000, which they had managed to accumulate uh, during his minority. And not surprisingly, before his death, just four years later, as we know, not surprisingly, Roger made the Earl of Northumberland the chief executor uh, of his will, um, thus giving the Earls of, of Northumberland, the, the, the Percy family, a big say in what would happen next to the Mortimer um, estates. Between 1399 and 1403, the um, Percy-Mortimer alliance moved to the very centre of the English uh, political stage. This was the period of the Percy ascendancy, the first three or four years of Henry IV's reign. Uh, the period when the Mortimers, uh, sorry, the Percys were without doubt the most powerful family in England after the royal family. And they, during this time, they had almost total control of the Mortimer <laughs> estates. And it was on behalf of the Earl of March, or at least so they said, it was on behalf of Edmund and his right to be king that the Percys rebelled, that is, Henry Earl of Northumberland, Hotspur, and the Earl of Northumberland's brother, Thomas Percy, Earl of Worcester. It was on behalf of March that they rebelled against King Henry IV in 1403, at which time they claimed that when they had helped to put Bolingbroke on the throne in 1399, they had forced him to take an oath at Doncaster, they said, that he would not claim the throne for himself. At which time, in 1403, they also said that they had protested vociferously to Bolingbroke in, in 1399, that he should not take the crown for himself. And Hotspur claimed that he had boycotted uh, the coronation, in, uh, Henry IV's coronation, in protest against uh, Bolingbroke taking the throne for himself. Now, these claims are almost certainly disingenuous. They had been perfectly happy to take several very important and lucrative grants from Henry IV. We know that Hotspur was issued with robes for the coronation of Henry IV. Um, and we also know that the Percys had also claimed that Henry IV in 1399 had told them to send all their retainers home, you don't need them anymore, um, and therefore they hadn't been able to pursue their protest, but this is not true because they actually received wages uh, their retain for their retainers for large retinues to remain at Westminster through until the end of the Parliament of 1399. And of course they continued to receive an absolute cascade <coughs> of favours from Henry IV up until uh, 1402-3. But from 1402, it became clear that Henry was beginning to withdraw his favor from the Percys. Other people were coming to the fore and there were significant policy differences between the, uh, the Lancastrian king and the Mortimers. And that is what led to the rebellion in 1403 to try to put March on the throne, at which time, in order to justify their rebellion, it seems to me that they basically rewrote their role 
in the usurpation of Henry IV in 1399. But little good it did them. Um, the Battle of Shrewsbury on the 21st of July, 1403, was a complete disaster for the Percys. Thomas Percy, Earl of Worcester, was captured and executed. Hotspur was killed on the battlefield, and uh, basically Percy power was broken uh, from then on. And when the Earl of Northumberland, who claimed not really to have been involved and, and was for the moment pardoned by the king, when he rose in rebellion again in 1405, he was um, uh, driven into exile. And, uh, well, Percy power was now broken. But by this time, the house, the Ducal House of York, had come to the fore in supporting uh, the Mortimer claim. We see this first of all with the involvement of Constance and possibly the involvement also of Edward in the attempt to kidnap the Mortimer boys in February 1405. Um, but we see it, and I'm looking forward a little bit here, but then I'll come back again. We see it also in the well-known Southampton plot of 1415, uh, which was led by Richard, Earl of Cambridge, who was the younger brother of Constance and of Edward, Duke of York. Uh, so all three siblings, and there were only the three of them, all three siblings of, of the House of York, uh, at some point, uh, well, in some cases clearly did, and in other cases probably did try at different times to unseat Henry IV from his Lancastrian throne. And by this time, the link uh, with the Mortimers seems to be clearly established because in 1408, Anne, the sister of Earl Edmund, had married Richard Earl of Cambridge, had married Richard Earl of Cambridge, the man who was really the ringleader, or so it seems, of the Southampton plot. And this cemented an alliance which, with the House of York, which had been building for some 10 years uh, before this. In whose interests the um, alliance was really made is difficult to know. It's worth remembering that both Duke Edward um, and Thomas Holland, uh, the, 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 sorry, and Thomas Dispenser, um, the first husband uh, of um, uh, the, the, the uh, the husband of Constance, um, had been very close indeed to Richard II, very much members of his inner circle during the last few years of the reign. And it may be that what drove them was not so much a desire to put the, marches on the, the Earl of March on the throne, although that might have been the case, as simply hatred, uh, hatred of the Lancastrian dynasty. Um, and it may well be that they were really uh, using the Mortimers as a pawn. Uh, for their own interests. But, but that's, that's, I mean, that's really just very difficult to know. Okay, um, it's time to look at uncles. Three uncles I want to talk about, Sir Thomas Mortimer, Sir Edmund Mortimer, and John Mortimer. And of course, the long minorities of the young, uh, of the Earls of March made the role of uncles, made the roles of uncles doubly important, just as they made the marriages of the Mortimer women doubly important. Thomas? was probably, well, I think almost certainly, the bastard son of Roger, the second Earl, and his illegitimacy excluded him from inheritance of the Mortimer estates. But otherwise, he seems to have been treated as a full member of the family. And just to give you one example, in 1383, when that consortium of Earls took control of the Mortimer estates for the next 11 years, it was Thomas whom they appointed as head of the council. Uh, to administer the Mortimer estates, and as we've seen, he's reckoned to have done a pretty good job. By the mid to late 1380s, Richard II was making ominous, um, making, making on, was, was developing on, ominous, ominous intentions uh, towards the lands of the Welsh border, um, and uh, Thomas clearly believed that this constituted uh, a threat to the integrity of the March inheritance. And so when the rebel earls and, well, the Duke of Gloucester, the Earls of Arundel, the Earl of Arundel and the Earl of Warwick, when they rebelled against Richard II in December 1387, Thomas joined with them, Sir Thomas Mortimer, the illegitimate son of, of Roger III. He joined with them and was one of the captains of the, the appellant army that defeated the um, Royalist army led by Robert de Vere at the Battle of Redcott, Rad Radcott Bridge in December uh, 1387. Uh, for this, he incurred the undying enmity 
of Richard II. And ten years later, when Richard II um, appealed of treason, the Duke of Gloucester, the Earl of Arundel, and the Earl of Warwick, he also appealed Sir Thomas um, of treason. Fortunately, Sir Thomas was in Ireland at the time, where he was with his nephew, uh, Roger. Richard II sent a summons to Roger, saying, hand over your uncle to me. He has been appealed of treason, and he needs to be brought here. And um, he apparently, according again to Adam Usk's chronicle, he remarked to one of his courtiers at the time, rather slyly, Perhaps the Earl of March will be unable to capture him. I shall wait, therefore, until I hear what has been accomplished. Uh, a sort of, uh, what one might think of as an almost characteristically sly remark uh, by Richard II. Clearly, this was going to be a test of loyalty for Roger. Um, but Roger protected his uncle. Roger made sure that his uncle, Thomas, was not handed over to Westminster, where he would almost certainly have suffered a traitor's death. Um, instead, Thomas fled to Scotland, uh, where he in fact died a year later, um, but of natural causes. He died in May 1399. But he was a man who had most certainly done his bit for the Mortimer family, and actually he should be rather better known uh, than he is. So let's move on to Edmund. Edmund is the brother, the younger brother, of Roger, the fourth earl. And after Roger's death in 39, he is of course much better known. Than, than Thomas. Um, uh, and and, and he, uh, after um, Roger's death in 1398, Edmund becomes really the foremost defender of the Mortimer family interests. He was very generously provided for by his brother. He clearly got on very well um, with his brother. Usk refers to him at one point as Dominus Maus, my lord, and Usk only refers to Earls of March or the Archbishop of Arundel as Dominus Maus, my lord. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it, 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 it's an indication of the role that he saw uh, Sir Edmund Mortimer as holding as the foremost representative of the Earldom of March uh, after Roger's uh, death, the foremost defender of the, uh, the Earldom of March. Um, Edmund also got on well with Hotspur and the Percys, which was fortunate, and what they were in many ways united by, by 1402 anyway, was their dislike um, of Henry IV. Initially, of course, he supported Henry IV, but by 1402 uh, he had clearly lost patience or simply, simply uh, just decided that Henry IV was not the man to be king. And now, cause and effect are actually quite difficult to disentangle at this point, but the sequence of events which followed was uh, uh, as follows. In June 1402, Oain Glendur, the leader of the Welsh revolt, launched a raid into the central march where Edmund's <laughs> lands were. He held the, 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 the marcher lordships of Narbeth and St. Clears, um, and Edmund was captured at the Battle of Brindlas. And he was taken away by Glendur to Snowdon uh, as a captive. Now, the normal procedure would have been to ransom him. This is what, this is what happened um, with um, uh, Reginald Grey of Ruthyn who was captured just a little bit earlier in the year he was ransomed. But Henry IV proved very reluctant to ransom Earl Edmund, um, probably because he believed the rumours, and it's very difficult to know the truth of these rumours, he believed the rumours that Edmund had colluded in his own capture and was actually sympathetic towards Glyndor and wanted to join Glyndor. Well, um, that was a, a kind of self-fulfilling uh, rumour as it were. Hotspur was absolutely furious with Henry IV for not ransoming his brother-in-law, which he thought should have happened, and uh, the result was that in November 1402, five months after his capture, Edmund married Catherine, the daughter of Owen Glyndur, and sent a letter to his tenants proclaiming his support for Glyndar and urging them to rebel uh, against Henry IV. And he said, if Richard II is still alive, and of course there were all sorts of rumours that Richard II was, was still alive, but he wasn't. Um, he said, if Richard II is still alive, he should be king, and if he is not, then the rightful king is my nephew, the Earl of March. Edmund remained, remained allied to Glyndur for the rest of his life, which lasted just over six years. He supported the Percy Revolt 
1403, he'd spent all this time in Wales with Glendora, evading capture, as did Glendora, of course. Um, he supported the Percy Revolt. Uh, a, a couple, two or three years after the Percy Revolt, he drew up the, the famous tripartite indenture with the Earl of Northumberland and, um, and with Glendora, in which they, 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 they vowed jointly to dethrone the Lancastrian usurper, Henry IV, and to divide England and Wales uh, between them. Uh, but by 1408, it was clear that the Welsh Revolt was failing. Um, and almost the final real act of the Welsh Revolt was the Siege of Harlech in the winter of 1408 uh, to 9, which was held by Glyndor, had been held by Glyndor for over four years. Um, and Edmund died during the Siege of Harlech. Whether he died of starvation or whether he died of a wound received during the siege is, is not said. Um, his wife and children were captured, taken off to the Tower of London, where they, uh, uh, four or five years later, uh, died of the plague in the Tower of London. But despite um, his miserable fate, Edmund's miserable fate, and his uh, ultimate failure, there were important consequences from Edmund's uh, defection. The Mortimer name undoubtedly added a different level of legitimacy uh, to uh, Glendower's uh, revolt. His defiance of Henry IV also, of course, meant that the claim of the Earl of March was kept alive. It was clearly, it, it, it continued to be talked about at a time when it could well have just faded away. But perhaps most importantly, his um, defection to Glyndour created or fostered a sense of common purpose between the Mortimers uh, and the Welsh. Originally, of course, the Mortimers had been conquerors of see, the out, outsiders, the enemy without. Um, uh, in, in Wales. Now, from the early 13th century, that perception began to change. Because, and, and what the real reason for that was the marriage of Ralph Mortimer to the daughter of Llewellyn the Great, that is Gladys Thee, um, uh, which of course gave the Mortimers a Welsh bloodline which, and descent from the princes of Wales, which they naturally made a lot of. But, but they still tended invariably to side with the English kings and the marcher lords. In other words, to continue to uh, enforce the English conquest of Wales. Until 1402. Until 1402, when Edmund joined with Glyndor. And it's interesting, Sir Edmund clearly became a hero to the Welsh. Songs were composed about him and sung at bardic feasts in Wales. Uh, lurid portents were said to have occurred at his death, foretelling all sorts uh, of interesting things. And in the long term, this common purpose, this sense of common purpose, which was fostered between uh, the Mortimers and the native Welsh people, was, I think, to have uh, significant um, consequences. Um, because during the Wars of the Roses, the Lancastrian territorial preponderance in Wales was overwhelming. And of course, ultimately, the Tudors had their Welsh bloodline as well. But the support of the Welsh people and of certain crucial figures um, among the Marcher Lords, of course, the, famous, the most famous of whom was Sir William Herbert, Lord Herbert, um, helped to counteract, and the support of the Welsh people helped to counteract Lancastrian predominance in Wales and to counteract the Welsh bloodline claimed by the Tudors. It meant that the Lancastrian kings couldn't feel quite so sure of the allegiance of Wales as perhaps they felt they ought to. Let's come finally to John. Uh, we'll just go back with Sir John Mortimer, the last of the uncles whom I want to talk about. There is no certainty as to who John Mortimer was. Um, he may have been the illegitimate brother of Edmund. That is why I have, that is where I have fitted him in uh, to um, the, uh, the, the genealogy which you've got. He certainly claimed kinship with the Mortimers, but he wasn't treated very generously. He wasn't treated with anything like the same acceptance or generosity. For example, that Sir Thomas Mortimer, also illegitimate, was treated um, before 
uh, uh, had, had been back in the 1380s and 1390s. So he had to make his own way, which he did as a soldier, until 1418. And for, but in 1418, he was imprisoned for making seditious remarks about Henry V. He claimed that Henry V had no right to the throne and that his war in France was simply a folly. What we're talking about here is what is called, often called treason by words, um, legally a grey area in the 14th and 15th centuries. And the evidence against John was clearly very shaky. And it's worth noting that the first time he was tried, he was acquitted. But having been acquitted by a jury, he was immediately rearrested and sent back to the tower. And there his, his jailer, his jailer was a man named William King. And William King, when, when, when Mortimer was eventually tried a second time in 1424, William King was asked to give evidence against him. And because he had at one point allowed uh, Sir John to escape from the tower, he was naturally on his defense, um, uh, rather on the defensive. And this is the evidence of William King. Sir John Mortimer said the Earl of March was a, a door, an idiot, <laughs> that means. Yet the greatest, noblest, and worthiest in blood in this land, that if truth were known, he should be king. And he should be his heir, that is, John said, he should be, I, I should be his heir. But if the Earl of March would not take up the rule of the realm and the crown, he would do so, because he was the next heir. Now, this was clearly a man who was um, blessed with more than his usual share of delusions. Um, uh, but anyway, his, um, he gave this evidence, and as a result of it, John Mortimer was executed as a traitor in 1424. This was a very controversial decision at the time and was noted as such by many chroniclers. It also involved a retrospective act of parliament being passed. Um, what his story really demonstrates is the, the, the acute desire of the Lancastrians to get, rid of, uh, to get rid of him and their continuing insecurity um, when confronted with Mortimer claims uh, to the throne. And it's worth remembering that when the rebel Jack Cade rebelled in 1450, he adopted as his nom de guerre the pseudonym John Mortimer. Let's go on finally to Edmund the Good, Henry IV and Henry V. Some facts about Edmund's life. He was born in November 1391. He succeeded as heir in 1398. His estates were probably worth in the region of three and a half thousand pounds. They were concentrated particularly in the Welsh marches in Ireland and in Suffolk around the great honor of Clare. There was, he had great status and great wealth, and there were great expectations of him, stemming really from the 1368 marriage. And we've seen, Matt has explained, so I don't have to go through it again, all the, the various references to the possibility of you know, the Mortimer claim to the throne uh, in the 1370s and 1380s and 1390s. The one thing that I would point out is that uh, all of these references come from chronicles. They, are all, they all come from chronicles. The one piece of what you might call documentary evidence is Edward III's entail of October 1376, in which March is not mentioned. Um, the March claim to the throne was far too sensitive to be mentioned in any official records. Don't mention the Mortimers. They are, they, it doesn't come up in the rolls of Parliament, it doesn't come up in the minutes of the Council. Far too sensitive. Now, as I've said, Henry IV treated Edmund and Roger humanely, but they were kept on a tight leash. It's sometimes said that in February 1409, when they were transferred to the custody of Prince Henry, the future King Henry V, it's sometimes said that this was a sort of um, uh, 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 the first steps of, of, of their release, really. Um, but it's worth noting, February 1409 was precisely the moment when Henry IV was, was almost thought to be on his deathbed. In fact, he lasted for another four years, but, but he had a very, very serious illness, uh, began in January 1409 and lasted for six weeks, drew up his will and so forth. And this, this seems to me very much like uh, a security policy, an insurance policy against the likelihood, as it was seen then, of the king's death. So they were being handed over to the next king to make sure um, nothing, uh, nothing untoward happened. However, if they were brought up by um, uh, the king with hu humanity, they, they, they were never openly acknowledged as members of the royal family. Um, Edmund's coming of age, Edmund the Good, um, that is the, the, the fifth earl, Edmund's coming of age was delayed. Henry IV, somewhat ingen disingenuously, claimed that he'd forgotten when he was born. Um, but uh, eventually, 
uh, Henry V said, yes, I know when you were born, so you may come of age. Um, he was not, but Ed Edmund was never made a Knight of the Garter. He was never given a dukedom, and you would expect someone as, of his a status, status, both to be a Knight of the Garter and to be given a dukedom. And there were deliberate snubs. In 1412, Henry IV made his own second son, Thomas, Duke of Clarence. Mm. Now, Duke of Clarence was a title <laughs> invented for the Earls of March, based on their, um, uh, sorry, for, for uh, it, was ba it was based upon the, the, um, uh, the, the holding of the, the, the Lordship of Clare in Suffolk. That's where the name comes from, Clarence, from, from the Lordship of Clare in Sussex, uh, in Suffolk, an estate held by uh, the Earls of March. And uh, when, for Henry IV to grant this, this great title, the Dukedom of Clarence, to his own son, just at the point when he knew, and I'm quite sure he knew perfectly well, that Edmund was about to come of age, um, is, 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 a, is a none too subtle way of saying there's no way this title is coming back to your family at any point in uh, the near future. At the very beginning of Henry V's reign, um, Roger died, Roger the younger brother of Edmund. So there's only, there's only Edmund left now. The Welsh revolt is over, Henry V is clearly more secure on the throne than his uh, and his father had been, and Edmund is treated rather better. Indeed, it is suggested that he actually becomes quite good friends with Henry V. Well, maybe, but he certainly kept very close. Henry, he seems to spend his whole time with the king. And, you know, one suspects that there is an element here of, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, um, and so forth. Nevertheless, in 1413 to 14, he's given livery of his estates. He's made a knight of the bath, but not of the garter, which was much more prestigious. And by 1414, he was a member of the Royal Council. However, 1415 was a very dangerous year indeed for Edmund uh, the Good. Firstly, there was the question of his marriage. He married Anne Stafford, probably at the very beginning of 1415, without permission. He didn't get permission from the king. Henry V imposed a fine of 10,000 marks on him. That is, you know, six and a half thousand pounds. Now, as many people have commented, no, no, no king since King John, the, 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 the notorious exorbitant immersements imposed by King John on his barons in the early 13th century, no king since, since, since King John had imposed a fine that big for this sort of offence. So uh, it's been suggested that this was intended really to cripple Edmund financially, and it, was, it, it, it amounted to about twice his annual, his, his, his annual income. Um, and he was made to pay it. He was made to pay it too. Uh, in the first parliament of Henry VI's reign, he said, um, I've paid 90% of this, and you owe me lots of war wages, so can you let me off the rest? So they said yes. Um, so he, he did actually have to pay about 90% of it. But then, of course, came the Southampton plot. Um, some people think that Edmund initially conspired with the plotters, that is, Cambridge, uh, the Earl, Richard Earl of Cambridge, Thomas Lord Grey, uh, Thomas, Sir Thomas Grey, and Henry Lord Scroop. Um, they were certainly keen to implicate him. Um, this is the confession that they all drew up confessions before they were beheaded. The confession of Sir Thomas Grey. I said the Earl of March was but a hulk. That is a coward. And Lucy, this is, his, this is some, one, of, one of March's retainers, a man called Sir Walter Lucy, who seems to have acted as the go-between. But, but he, he got away scot-free, like a chap. And Lucy said, yes, truly, he should behave like a man and vindicate his right. And I asked how, and Lucy said the Lord Scroop had been to the Earl of March, of Scroop's own will, and the highest and the haughtiest spoke to him and bade him take on hand for his right to the crown. For truly, gracious Lord, Lucy said that Scroop said to the Earl of March that you, Henry V, were under, whether you stayed or went, or stayed in England or, or went uh, to France. Cambridge also indicated, um, uh, implicated him. Confession of Richard, Earl of Cambridge. And as touching the Earl of March and Lucy, his man, they told me both that the Earl was not that shriveled and has confessed for a great while, but that all his confessors put him in penance to claim what they called his right. A very interesting comment, very interesting sidelight on the role of uh, confessors um, at the time. Uh, I think the point is that March was clearly under pressure to pursue his claim. And both Brynmore Pugh and Gerald Harris, um, who didn't like Edmund Earl of March, both Brynmore Pugh and neither of them did, um, they think that he initially conspired with the, the plotters and then turned around and betrayed them. 
But it's worth noting, none of the plotters said that he had agreed at any point with their plans. They said they had spoken to him, but they never said that he had agreed with their plans, only that he had listened. And the chroniclers tell a different story. The Gesta, Henrique Quinty, Adam Musk, John Stretch, they all say that he was innocent of, of any um, involvement in, in the plot. Walsingham says, Walsingham has an interesting story, which somehow I think has the ring of truth about it. Walsingham says that the three plotters went to him and made him swear. They said, we're going to tell you something, and you've got to absolutely promise not to tell anyone. So, slightly foolishly, he said, OK. Then they told him that they were planning to kill the king and make him king, whereupon he was so horrified that he immediately told Henry V. And that was the unmasking of the Southampton plot. Now, the truth, as ever, is rather elusive. Um, but fortunately for Edmund, Henry V believed him. He was fully pardoned in a rather interestingly worded pardon, which included any ignorances, concealments, or deceptions <laughs> in which he might have been involved. The three plotters were duly beheaded straight away, and Henry V, together with Earl Edmund, sailed to France. Um, and of course, ultimately to glory at Agincourt. But Edmund was not at Agincourt. He was at the siege of Harfleur, but he was invalided home with dysentery. However, once the war began again, when Henry V invaded France in 1417, for the next five years, Edmund held a series of highly responsible uh, posts in the, the, the Anglo-French War. He was in charge of a, a fleet to sweep the channel for French vessels in 1417. 1418, he was made Lieutenant of Normandy. Um, 1419 to 1421, he was on the council that governed Normandy. And you find that his quasi-royal estate, or quasi-royal status rather, is increasingly being acknowledged at this time. For example, at the marriage, uh, the coronation, sorry, of Catherine de Valois, uh, Henry V's Queen in February 1421. He kneels on the right-hand side of Queen Catherine in Westminster Abbey and he holds uh, her scepter for her. And he is the chief mourner after the immediate members of the royal family, the chief mourner at Henry V's funeral. He had in fact been with Henry at the siege of Meaux, the final act really of Henry V's life and he was with Henry on his deathbed, Henry V, when he died on the 31st of August, 1422. The death of Henry V, unfortunately, seems to have revived suspicions of the Mortimers. In the 1423-4 Parliament, uh, the Duke of Gloucester, that is Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, uh, Henry VI's uncle, one of, the, one of the brothers of Henry V, openly accused March of trying to curry, trying to raise popular support. He said he held open house, encouraging him at a place called Salisbury Inn in London, held open house, inviting people to come and eat and drink, and he, he, made an, he maintained an excessive revenue, an excessive retinue, um, far more than Henry V had been prepared to allow him. And of course, it was also this parliament which condemned uh, John Mortimer. And one chronicler suggests that this is why Edmund was sent to Ireland. Um, he was appointed as Lieutenant of Ireland in uh, June or May or June 1423 for nine years. Um, but he didn't leave for another year. He left in 1424. And was this a way of trying to, uh, you know, get him out of the way? But actually, I don't think there's anything too suspicious about his appointment in Ireland. The Mortimers were always the preferred mediators um, in Ireland. And this was just at the time when the, the feud between the Earl of Ormond and uh, John Talbot, John Lord Talbot, in Ireland was escalating to dangerous levels and they needed someone with the authority and the status of March. However, um, if it was intended to get him out of the way, it worked a treat um, because he died within six months of arriving in Ireland as of course his father and his grandfather had also died in Ireland. Uh, he died of the plague at Trim in January 1425. He'd been married for 10 years, but had no children, and so all his estates, his titles, and so forth, descended to Richard, Duke of York, who you're going to hear a lot more about this afternoon. So what are we to make of Earl, of Earl Edmund? Um, this is my conclusion. With one or two exceptions, historians have really thought not very much of him. Um, the charge most commonly laid against him is either that he betrayed the Southampton plotters, or that he simply lacked the will 
or the courage to pursue his rights. Thomas Gray, John Mortimer, they thought that was the case. They were both desperate men, hardly reliable. Um, the alleged influence of Mortimer's, of Edmund's confessors is interesting. Uh, because there is certainly evidence that he was devout. The Wigmore Chronicler said he was known as Edmund the Good because of his piety and his generosity. And, uh, oh, so that's not what, not what I wanted. That's what I want. Um, and the Wigmore Chronicler said um, uh, that this Edmund was called Edmund the Good, a man austere in his morals, composed in his acts, circumspe circumspect in his talk, and wise and cautious <coughs> during the days of his adversity. He refounded the uh, alien priory of Stoke by Clare in Suffolk and endowed, endowed it extremely generously as uh, a college of secular canons. Uh, we know from his household accounts that he played the harp and um, apparently broken off a lot of harp strings because, because his treasurers constantly seemed to be buying them for him. He bought missiles, he bought religious images, he gave plenty of arms to the poor. But there was also another side to his character which has often been rather uh, overemphasized. His household account in 1413 to 14 also records 70 different occasions within eight months on which he lost money gambling. Gambling on everything from obscure medieval games of dice and whatever, from back to backgammon to cockfighting. Now that doesn't mean that he was an inveterate loser because this is the sort of account which only recorded what had to be paid out. In other words, if he'd made winnings gambling, they would not have been recorded. He would just have pocketed them. Um, but it does suggest that he enjoyed uh, a flutter. And there are also some really quite suspiciously generous payments to a certain Alice who lived at Poplar. Um, it was on the basis of this evidence that Rhys Davies, uh, a, great, a great historian indeed of the Welsh March, described Edmund as an extravagant rake. Uh, I think I prefer Bruce McFarlane's slightly more measured judgment. Um, that he must have saved Henry V's court, where he spent at least part of his time, from being too straight-laced. <laughs> and um, I, think, I think that um, several 22-year-old bachelors would probably settle for that. Um, and I also think that it's an image which seems to me to fit slightly better with the feisty eight-year-old who stood up before the King's Council in the summer of 1400, and indeed the rather offbeat gift of two precocious Welsh children and their child to the king in 1414. I certainly hope that Edmund managed to enjoy himself a bit because politically he spent his life walking on eggshells. Uh, the temptation to raise a rebellion must have been enormous and so apparently was the pressure. And of course a lot of this was a question of that thing that mattered so much to the medieval nobility, the question of honour. By the standards of the time it was almost a moral imperative for individuals as well as for nations not to relinquish their claims without a fight. Uh, and, as I say, the pressure on Edmund to do this, to, to not to relinquish his claims, to fight for them, in other words, um, must have been tremendous. Friends, relatives, and uh, spiritual confidence, apparently, urged him to rebel. And when he didn't, they called him a coward or accused him of shaming his lineage. And I can't help thinking it's easy enough for modern historians to pick up on this and to sneer at what they characterise as spinelessness or vacillation. But if you just think, if Edmund had indeed decided to take a chance, he would almost certainly have failed, as all the others did. And his family would have lost everything. Estates, titles, claims. And the fact that he managed to steer a path um, towards survival is evidence not of cowardice, I think, but of common sense. Although common sense might not make history more exciting, it can be quite useful in ensuring that one's head remains attached to one's body. Um, but really, the story of the Mortimers in the late 14th century and early 15th century is not the story of Earl Edmund. It's the story of a clan. Considering his great status, Edmund is actually an oddly inconspicuous character in early 15th century English history. This may have been a sensible policy, but, his, his, but, it, but what it meant was that the Mortimer claim to the throne was kept alive by others, by uncles, by brothers-in-law, by widows, by wives. After all, between 1381 and 1413, a period of 32 years, you only have four years of, act of an active adult earl. And for the remaining 28, it is the brothers-in-law and the uncles 
and the widows and the wives who are trying to stand up for, or, or at least to make sure that the, 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 the Mortimer claim to the throne doesn't uh, get forgotten. Some of those who championed the Mortimers were doubtless acting in their own interests rather than Edmund's, or perhaps simply out of hatred for the Lancastrian dynasty. And of course, all their efforts ended in personal failure and frequently in execution. In some cases, of course, the alliances made at this time were ephemeral. For example, with the Percys, who were consistently Lancastrian during the Wars of the Roses. In other cases, however, the results of their efforts were of lasting significance. The Welsh connection certainly became more important, and the alliance with the House of York was, of course, in the long term, pivotal. Their efforts also meant that the element of continuity, which was so vital for a family constantly emasculated by minorities, was maintained. Collectively, the Mortimer clan and its allies in the years between 1381 and 1425 had refused to allow the rights inherent in the name of Mortimer simply to fade away, despite the attempts made by Henry IV and Henry V to airbrush it out of history. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.